Hi everyone and welcome to Attentive Healthcare Solutions webinars. My name is Medical Records, Navigating Parental and Patient Rights. My name is Chelsea Grover and I'm Marketing Communications Coordinator for Attentive. Before we dive into today's webinar, I wanted to take a moment to explain the process for today's presentation. First, I'd like to mention this webinar will be recorded. We'll send out a copy of the slides along with the recording within the next week. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Itenev, I wanted to share a bit of who we are with you. We specialize specifically in next-gen healthcare, and we're passionate about providing solutions for our healthcare provider partners, which in turn help them to improve patient care, enhance the patient experience, and maintain a financially healthy practice. To sum it up, we do everything next-gen. And we also have some next-gen add-on productivity solutions, including ChartGuard and Refund Manager. Next, I'm not sure how we're nearly into the new year, but we are. We're still generating ideas for our 2021 webinars, so keep your eyes out for an announcement on the next one. And similarly, if you have ideas of topics that you'd like to hear in the future, let us know in the questions area of the webinar control panel or shoot us an email. We're always looking for input on what's important to you. Okay, so back to today's webinars on minor medical records navigating parental and patient rights. At the end of the presentation, we'll open the floor up to questions from you. We'll answer all the questions at the end, but you may type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel whenever they occur to you. And finally, for audio clarity purposes, everyone's phone will remain muted throughout the entire webinar. If you experience audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. And again, questions may be entered in the questions box. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Lindsay Lanning is Manager of Client Development and Carly Hogan is Client Solutions Administrator. And we'll also have Cindy Kincaid standing by to help answer questions in the end. So Lindsay, the webinar is all yours. Take it away when you're ready. Great. Well, thank you, Chelsea. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar on Minor Medical Records, Navigating Parental and Patient Rights. Um, you know, we know establishing general guidelines for your practice when dealing with minors and their rights can be pretty complicated, particularly in today's very heavily regulated environment. So today in this presentation, we're gonna analyze these regulations and the challenges they represent. We will review the tools and functionality available in both the new NextGen PXP patient portal, as well as protecting teen confidentiality within NextGen Enterprise itself. In addition, due to COVID-19, we've actually added a brief section on telehealth and minors with emphasis on a new piece of legislation that has been introduced called the Tykes Act and its impact. You know, we, we picked this topic today because we understand finding harmony is difficult when balancing parental rights and those of your minor patients. So we wanna make sure you're aware of the regulations and the tools already available to you to ensure compliance for your practice. We wanted to begin by reviewing the HIPAA laws that apply to minor confidentiality. You know, let's start with the basics and kind of work our way through it because we all know HIPAA is the cornerstone regulation for this topic. So the HIPAA privacy rule is the federal standard that you know, generally allows a parent to have access to the medical records about his or her child when such access is not inconsistent with state or other law. Um, HIPAA really is you know, the foundation and, and truly sets the bare minimum here. So the parent of a minor is typically considered the minor's personal representative or the person with legal authority to make healthcare decisions on behalf of that individual. And as we mentioned, the HIPAA privacy rule is the federal standard, but HIPAA defers to state and other applicable laws if those are more stringent than HIPAA, meaning those are stricter. So medical record access for minors is you know, more typically defined at the state level. For minors under the age of 12, um, we will say, you know, generalization here, most states allow full parental access to medical records. And then for minors between the ages of 12 to 17, the parental right to access medical records depends on the type of treatment the patient's receiving. So under HIPAA, there are three situations when the parent would not be the minor's personal representative. And that means they would be unable to access their record. So those three situations are one, when the minor is the one who consents to care and the consent of the parent is not required by law. So for example, testing for an STD. Um, the second scenario is when the minor obtains care at the direction of a court or a person appointed by the court. So think of a court approval to obtain an abortion without the parent's knowledge. And then 
Finally, the last scenario, when the parent agrees that the minor and the healthcare provider may have a confidential relationship, you know, which most often occurs when an adolescent is actually seen by a physician who knows the family. Um, however, in these situations, the parent may actually have access to the medical record of the minor related to this type of treatment when, again, state or other applicable law permits, such as parental access. Um, so now if the state law is silent on a parent's right of access in these cases, the licensed healthcare provider may actually exercise his or her professional judgment to the extent allowed by law to grant or deny parental access to the, minor, the minor's medical information, which leads us to the parent's access to information. So in those situations that we just discussed, when a minor's parent would not have access to the minor's record, the minor is considered the individual. When this is the case, the minor may exercise most of the same rights as an adult under the HIPAA privacy rule except for state or other applicable laws say otherwise. You know, I feel like that's gonna be the money phrase for this webinar and I'll probably have to say it another dozen more times, but if I don't, um, you know, it's, a, it's an important part of this that we always have to throw in here. Yes, HIPAA is the standard, but where state or other applicable laws apply or are more stringent, we need to recognize those. Um, but where those state or other applicable laws uh, can do this are kind of one of four instances here. Either the first one, they would require information to be disclosed to the parent, which I will say is mandated in very, very few states. Um, two, they can permit information to be disclosed to the parent, which would be, again, at the provider's discretion. Three, prohibit information from being disclosed to the parent. Or four, the state law may be silent on this matter. So again, it's gonna leave that choice of record access up to the provider. So, you know, the key words here for each scenario are what we highlighted, require, permit, prohibit, or that they're silent. And those are kind of those four options that we see with those state or other laws, um, you know, being stricter than HIPAA. There's also a crucial special privacy protection where under HIPAA privacy rule, a provider may choose not to treat a parent as a personal representative when the provider reasonably, reasonably believes that the child has been or may be subjected to um, domestic violence, abuse or neglect, or that treating the parent as the child's personal representative could endanger the child in any way. Um, you know, for, for anyone who watches Grey's Anatomy out there, yes, it is still on. Uh, they just had a great episode displaying this exact special circumstance where they believe the child was being human trafficked and they withheld the information from her guardian. So there is an example of a special situation that this would apply to. Now, from what we've discussed so far, I think it's clear that HIPAA and state laws are trying to put the well-being of the minor at the forefront of the purpose of their laws. But sadly, there's no one simple law for all states. And we, of course, do not want to spend your time discussing 50 different state laws. But in general, Every state has laws that allow minors to give their own consent for some kinds of health care. Um, that can include emergency care, general health, um, you know, we see contraceptive, pregnancy related, HIV or other STD, and then substance abuse and mental health care as well. And every state also has some laws that allow minors to consent for care if they are emancipated, um, if they're considered mature, if they're living apart from their parents. Um, if they, the minor themselves, are pregnant or are parents themselves, if their high school graduates are older than a certain age as well. And the HIPAA privacy rule defers, again, to these laws. So basically, adolescents and their healthcare providers expect that when an adolescent can consent to their own care, such as, you know, in the situations we suggested, that information pertaining to it will usually be considered confidential kind of just a rule of thumb and explaining this as simply as possible. Now, as much as we wish we could give you a blanket recommendation for how to approach minor confidentiality, laws truly vary state by state. And we aren't just saying that. <laughs> so to prove this to you, we wanted to include this slide so you could see some examples of how much states can vary for allowing minors to consent to different types of treatment. Um, so you can see that in New York and Ohio, 
It's a common requirement for a minor to be deemed mature by a physician in order to accept treatment. While there's a specific definition of mature minor in each state, generally it means that the physician considers the minor to be um, emotionally and intellectually mature enough to give informed consent for a certain treatment without any parental consent. You can also see kind of here across the board, uh, there's different ages for different treatments. Across those four states, if I'm looking out there right now, you know, I see 12, I see 14, I see 16, I even see the phrase any age. Um, so it really all depends. So again, moral of the story, um, if you are currently working on implementing or reviewing your own practice policies around minor confidentiality, make sure you are thoroughly researching your individual state laws. Um, you know, we we researched these four to kind of kick us off here. I wish we could have kind of gone through our, our registration list and, and found out what state everyone was in to really hone in on that. But we wanted to show you with this slide all the differences that and these states are all pretty close to each other um, and have kind of similar regulations in place. We wanted to show you how much things can vary state by state um, and how these state laws are often stricter, or more stringent than the HIPAA laws. Now, before we get away from HIPAA completely, we did want to discuss this newer kind of buzz term you may have been hearing a lot about in the last year, and that's the HIPAA Right of Access Initiative. So when you hear the term HIPAA privacy rule, the first thing you probably think of is the obligation to keep PHI secure and to not disclose it inappropriately but there is a lesser known part of the privacy rule called right of access that seemed to fly somewhat under the radar for many years because it was rarely enforced or audited. But in 2019, the Office for Civil Rights or OCR, you know, they're the ones that, that uphold HIPAA, um, they commenced its right of action or right of access initiative to make it a priority to support individuals' right to timely access to their health records at a reasonable cost. Um, and right now, OCR defines timely as within 30 days. And just this past year, OCR has aggressively begun to enforce the right of access initiative with many of these incidences involving minor records. So it's important to note that while OCR you know, has relaxed some portions of HIPAA during the public health emergency, this has not extended to the right of access requirement. Um, and yes, I keep dramatically emphasizing these bullets because I can't open up my email on a weekly basis or even a daily basis at this point without a right of access violation or settlement article popping up in some way, shape or form. It is insane how hard they have cracked down on these. Um, truly, it almost seems as though they have kind of tunnel vision on this particular portion of HIPAA right now. So while the right of access initiative does not explicitly involve minors. Um, we did want to bring it attention today because this enforcement is only a year old um, and several of the settlements that have been reached, I know we already mentioned this, have involved minors records. So just an example, you know, one of the first highly publicized examples of this right of access initiative actually involved a mother who complained to OCR about a health system that failed to provide her with timely access of her newborn's records. So back in October of 2017, uh, this mother submitted a written request to this health center requesting the fetal heart monitor records from her delivery. Now, initially, the health system stated that the records were not found before later producing those records in August of 2018. Um, and that was only in response to the mother's attorney getting involved. So the mother submitted a complaint to OCR and since the health system did not provide the records for her child, obviously within 30 days, um, OCR actually reached an $85,000 settlement with that health system just last year. And that was actually the first case settled in the HIPAA right of access initiative. Um, now in that past year since then, 11 additional cases, several involving minor records have been settled with fines totaling over $500,000 and intensive corrective action plans. So how can you ensure that you're complying and providing your patients with timely access? So let's start with the general requirement of the right of access portion of the rule. So again, the general requirement of this rule 
is for covered entities to provide individuals upon request with access to PHI about them or a minor for which they are the personal representative in a timely manner. And again, timely is generally considered within 30 days of the request, and that is at the federal level. Uh, psychotherapy notes should not be included in the request. And there are specific rules regarding you know, the maximum fees that can be charged when providing records to patients as well. So covered entities um, you know, should review their policies and practices. You know, we, like all aspects of HIPAA, um, you need to have these policies and procedures in place to help ensure your practice is responding to patient record requests in a timely manner. You wanna ensure that you are training all staff on HIPAA laws, particularly when it comes to responding to these record requests. And unlike HIPAA data breach settlements, which if we think about it, you know, think ransomware, think, um, you know, when something's stolen and, the, and there's that leak of information, those tend to involve breaches of, you know, hundreds or thousands, you know, on a very large scale, even millions of patient records. Right of access settlements have stemmed from complaints filed by just one single person. And going along with the kind of the main theme of our webinar today is you need to reference state laws. Um, as a rule of thumb, if the state law is more strict than HIPAA, it will take precedence. So for example, if your state considers a timely return on records to actually be 15 days, then you need to get your records to your patient in 15 days and not 30. All right, well, there are certainly a lot of aspects of confidentiality to keep track of when it comes to HIPAA and of course state laws. So I'm sure you may be wondering, um, what is the best way to ensure I'm following all these laws and how can I utilize NextGen to help me with this? So we have some ideas on how NextGen can help and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Carly so she can dive into this further. So Carly, it's all yours. Awesome, thank you, Lindsay. So as I'm sure you've come to understand from everything Lindsay has discussed today, there's many nuances to minor medical record laws and parent or guardian access, making it hard to set a clear cut protocol for handling these instances. At this time, NextGen does not have any processes set up to automate restrictions for access to minor records, but we'll still be discussing some best practices that you may want to implement in your practice to ensure you're following all confidentiality laws for your minor patients. First, it's important to track any occasion when records for minors are disclosed. And really, this isn't limited to just minors. It's important to have these processes in place for disclosing records for any of your patients. So what should you consider when creating a process for appropriate record disclosure? Well, we are starting to sound like a broken record, no pun intended, but step one is thoroughly understanding federal and state laws. Next, you need to make sure you obtain all proper consents. Also, ensure your entire team is well educated on your processes and make sure you document any disclosures in the appropriate area of the EHR, which leads us into NextGen's PHI log. So the PHI log allows you to track one, how a record request was made, what format the records were requested in, and when the records were provided. It can be accessed from several places, but the simplest is usually the PHI log link on the patient information bar. When record requests are received, both clinical and front office staff utilize the EHR to view HIPAA documentation and the disclosures of PHI log. PHI disclosures can be automatically or manually updated. For example, if NextGen Share is used, a disclosure would be automatically generated. In this instance, we'll show you an example of manually adding a PHI log disclosure to a patient's record. So upon opening up the PHI log link, you'll see this screen, and then you would select add, which we have highlighted in yellow, and a new disclosure of PHI would open. So this example is filled out as though a physician had requested a patient's record, but you can see the options to fill in who has requested the record, how it's provided, and the purpose of the disclosure. If you see 
in the processed by box where it currently says next gen admin that's where the user would always autofill so whoever's logged into the system um, and that would track who released the PHI. Once all that information is added and saved, this disclosure would be added to the list shown on the right, which makes for an easy place to track all PHI disclosures for that patient. If you select the PHI log history, you can produce a document with all PHI disclosure details that is printable. In that same PHI log template, by scrolling to the bottom, you'll also find the HIPAA disclosure information pop-up. As you can see, here you can make notes to specifically exempt portions of the record from disclosure or specify who you can or cannot disclose to. This will save within the PHI log, but it's important to note that this will not act as a pop-up each time records are disclosed for that patient. So let's say you have a minor patient who's had an abortion and your staff member has added a HIPAA disclosure stating that this portion of the minor's record should not be released to their parents. You should make it very clear in your practice's record disclosure policy and also while you're training your staff on HIPAA that before any staff member releases a patient's records, they must review any entries in the HIPAA disclosure information. In our example, this would prevent the staff member from releasing that portion of the minor's record. Now, if you are concerned that staff may not always remember to check this, you might want to have staff members also add a chart alert whenever they input a HIPAA disclosure. So in our example, the same staff member who entered that HIPAA disclosure instructing to not release records regarding this patient's abortion would also add a chart alert at that time, maybe stating something like, you know, check HIPAA disclosures before releasing any records or something to very clearly get the next user's attention so that they would be sure to not release this portion of the record. Okay, so we've discussed a solid process for tracking your record disclosure, but how do you know that a patient's not a minor anymore in your system? I mean, obviously you can see that their date of birth is now putting them at over 18, but within NextGen, how do you ensure that you aren't sharing a patient's record with a parent who's listed as their guarantor still when the patient just turned 18 and really should be their own guarantor? Since there's not currently an automated process within NextGen to notify a practice that a minor has aged out, a great alternative is to have a user run the report on this slide periodically. This report is found within patient chart demographics and shows all patients 18 or older with a guarantor relationship other than self. Those patients can then be worked from the report to update that relationship and ensure that no adult patient is still listed with an inappropriate guarantor. So basically making sure you don't have your patients that just turned 18 still with you know, their mom as their guarantor. So how can you set this report up? In order to display the patient's age on the columns tab, you can check off patient age and years. Next, we're only interested in patients who are not marked as their own guarantors. So we can set patient guarantor relationship to not equal self. Finally, we only want to see patients 18 and older, so we can set patient age and years to greater than 17. We want to use 17 so that we capture those patients that are 18 as well. And on this next reference slide, you can see the column patient age and years was selected and the report was filtered for a patient guarantor relationship not equal to self. And then finally, I set the patient age in years to greater than 17. So as a user runs this report periodically, they can use it to update the guarantor to self for any of those patients that have recently turned 18. All right, so we've come up with some best practices for disclosing records and updating those patients who have turned 18 to be their own guarantor but now we need a good way to mark in the chart that minors' records are sensitive and shouldn't be released to parents or guardians. One way is to utilize NextGen's sensitive encounter feature. So NextGen 591 has the ability to mark unlocked encounters as sensitive, 
sensitive, meaning that the encounter contains patient data that's not normally released to external sources. Marking an encounter as sensitive will either prevent the information in that encounter from being shared, or it will flag the encounter as sensitive so that the person sharing the information will be alerted and can take any necessary actions. Currently, sensitive encounters are limited to statements, the NextGen patient portal, referrals, NextGen care outreach campaigns, and the clinical message manager. In order to mark an encounter as sensitive, it's pretty simple. You would just right click on an unlocked encounter in your patient history toolbar, select sensitivity settings, then check the box to mark this as a sensitive encounter. At this point, you can also choose to not print this encounter on statements. And after that sensitive encounter box is checked, you will then also have the option to either suppress auto send to patient portal and or suppress outreach actions. So typically, once an encounter is locked for a patient who is enrolled in the NextGen patient portal, NextGen will automatically create a CCDA and send it to the portal account for that patient. Choosing that Suppress Auto Send to Portal button would not include the information from this encounter in the CCDA. So you can see why that could be a good option for minor records. Choosing the Suppress Outreach Actions option would not include information from this encounter in any outreach. Now, once you've selected OK after choosing the appropriate option, you will see the encounter marked with a red exclamation point. Anytime a user tries to share or print data from this encounter, you'll see the warning on the right side of the screen before you can proceed. Using sensitive encounters for certain parts of minor records could be a best practice that you want to consider implementing. All right, so sensitive encounters might sound like a really great option for some of you, but you may have noticed this feature can still be bypassed by some users because you can still bypass the warning. Um, so you might have been hoping for a way to absolutely prohibit certain encounters from being accessed by a minor's parent or guardian. One option that might work for you could be to utilize case management. So case management is used to group like encounters into a single case for a variety of purposes. While this is a much more manual process than doing something like sensitive encounters, users absolutely cannot see certain information depending on how you choose to set it up. In relation to what we have been talking about today, case management can be used to group together confidential encounters for a minor patient, so they would only be viewable to a certain group of users. For example, certain encounters can be marked as private when they are included in part of the case. If you do have access to this case, you would see the encounters just like any other encounter, but they would be within the little briefcase icon that you can see on your screen there. Having encounters within the case would block them from being added to any custom print send and would automatically exclude them from being sent to the portal. So this is a surefire way to stop a minor's confidential encounters from being added when a parent requests a disclosure of their records. So now that you have a few ways to protect minor confidentiality within NextGen Enterprise EHR, we wanted to hit on a few parts of NextGen's new PXP platform, including the patient portal and virtual visits, and how to navigate minor confidentiality within those platforms. So I'm sure you've all heard a bit about PXP. It includes a lot of new add-on products with tons of exciting functionality. Focusing first on the brand new patient portal, parents or guardians will be able to connect their own portal accounts to their child's account using what's called a linked account. To set this up, the practice would send an invitation to a minor's parent or guardian to view and manage the minor's account. More than one parent can have access to their child's information. So for example, divorced parents will have their own access to view their child's portal account. 
Once the parent is linked to the minor's account, they'll be able to toggle between their own account and then any accounts that have been linked to them. Now, the new portal does have an automatic patient age-out functionality. I don't want to confuse this with NextGen EHR. If you recall, Enterprise EHR does not currently have an automated functionality for this, so we discussed running that report to handle aging your patients out. However, the new patient portal does have this functionality to automatically age your patients out. So practices can choose to automatically age patients out in the portal when patients reach the age of adulthood defined by the practice. This would automatically disconnect the child account from the parent account, and this is an optional feature. Practices can instead choose to manually age their patients out, whether that is at the age of adulthood or prior to the age of adulthood, depending on the circumstances. For example, if the patient is emancipated. This slide details how you can set up an age to auto age patients out of the portal within Site Generator. This can be set up by selecting your state or you can set a practice age out age. So this is a super helpful feature. Now, currently, there is no way to limit what information a trusted representative or parent or guardian can see in the portal, but NextGen is looking into changing this. Until access to a minor's portal account can be restricted to only some information, it is important to consider implementing a temporary workaround to protect, protect confidentiality for your minor patients. One option could be to implement a policy that some minor patients, for example, like your 15 to 17 year old patients, can have access to their own portals, but that you won't allow parents to link to their account. So basically you'd only allow parents to access their charts via paper, which would give you the opportunity to sort out any confidential information before you released it to the child's parent. Another option, as we discussed earlier, would be to mark encounters as sensitive in NextGen EHR and then ensure you select that Suppress Auto Send to Patient Portal option. Last, consider encouraging your providers to document any confidential information in the Provider Plan section with a, within AP Details. Um, so it might be common practice for them to just automatically document in impression comments. But if they do document, um, if it's something confidential within that provider plan box, that information will not be sent to the patient portal. However, it is important to remember that while the notes recorded in there are not sent directly to the portal, patients can still request this as part of their record. Another part of NextGen's new PXP platform is NextGen Virtual Visits. And as you can imagine, this add-on product has been implemented by many practices since the pandemic began in order to accommodate telehealth visits for patients. With NextGen Virtual Visits, minors can participate in telehealth visits by themselves. Currently, minors can select the Legal Representative button that you see highlighted there on the screen instead of choosing Self when they begin a virtual visit. Um, so our example screenshot here is what it's going to look like on a mobile device, um, but it's very similar on a desktop. Basically, when they select that legal representative box, they will get a free text box to show up that will allow them to enter their own name, and then it will ask them what is their relationship to patient, and at that point, they would select self. Um, so Obviously, you know, NextGen is working on um, a little bit of a simpler process for minors, um, but that is their current workaround to conduct telehealth visits without having an adult present. Um, and NextGen has stated that their changes are on the roadmap for that. All right, so directly connected with our discussion on next-gen virtual visits is a piece of legislation that was introduced very recently called the Tykes Act. And I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Lindsay to wrap up today's presentation with that. Great, well, thank you, Carly.
All right, so the Tykes Act. Um, in early October of this year, the Telehealth Improvement for Kids Essential Services or Tykes Act of 2020 was introduced. So this act would actually require the Secretary of HHS to issue guidance to states about how to actually increase access to telehealth under Medicaid and CHIP. Multiple pediatric health systems issued statements in support of this legislation, saying that it actually creates an opportunity for the federal government to provide more clarity to states regarding telehealth expansion for children. So, you know, with this new legislation um, and many states expanding access to telehealth for both adults and minors, it's important for your practice to consider how you plan to provide those services in a confidential way. Um, we keep saying this, but it's the toothpaste metaphor um, that explains it best. You know, once you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, there's no getting it back, getting it to go back in. Um, and that's exactly the case with telehealth moving forward. There's no way we can go back to how it was after this year. Um, and, you know, luckily we don't have to. As of last night, <laughs> there was actually legislation released um, as a final rule that, that a lot of these flexibilities that we're seeing right now with telehealth would actually be made permanent. Um, so this brings to light new considerations for minors and their rights and, and how to handle telehealth moving forward. Uh, so we absolutely advise you to sit down and decide on you know, how you and your practice plan to handle minors and telehealth sooner rather than later, especially, you know, hot off the press. This, this was released, I think, about 5 or 6 p.m. last night. Um, and, you know, on a personal note here, <laughs> I absolutely love puns. And I think I just had a personal epiphany of why I love everything legislative and regulatory because of legislative names like this one bring me so much joy. It's called Tykes. It pertains to kids. Gotta love it. <laughs> All right. Well, now that I probably just sounded a bit crazy and hopefully maybe got a few laughs, um, likely lost a bit of credibility with you all. So let me go ahead and tell you what we advise you in your practice to do. Um, but in all seriousness, um, that was a lot of information. I think Carly and I moved quicker than we usually do through this information. We're used to speaking about regulations that go on and on and on. So we try to keep it truly to the point, um, you know, what you needed to know without digging into the weeds. We did take out a lot of state specific information today, um, only because, you know, our clients as of right now too, and all of you who are being invited to these webinars um, really truly are all over the place now. Um, so we didn't wanna focus on, on too many with those specifics if it really didn't apply to you guys and have you kind of zone out and have it not be um, valuable for you. So kind of just to summarize where to start with all of this and kind of wrap it up. So first would be to understand the laws of your state. And if they're not clear, follow the federal guidelines. We've talked about this a lot. We've honed it in. Um, you know, your state laws truly are the guiding force here. They are, they're either going to match the federal guidelines or be more strict. So I would start there with looking at your state laws first and foremost. Um, second is develop a clear internal policy for how your practice will handle minor confidentiality regarding your EHR. Um, so Carly went over a lot of great tools and tricks here and functionality today. Um, you know, I assume everyone on here is on NextGen um, for, for how to use this system and, and kind of use it to its fullest to help you um, stay in compliance with all of these guidelines. Three would be develop another clear internal policy for how your practice will handle minor confidentiality regarding your patient portal and telehealth. Um, we went over, you know, some functionality in the new NextGen uh, PXP patient portal, um, and we touched on, you know, not really a little bit with the PXP telehealth virtual visits um, as well, but also, you know, think about this is this is right at the forefront now with telehealth being finalized. So this is definitely going to be a huge issue. You want to kind of get ahead of this before um, it's too late or, or something were to happen. And then lastly, uh, make sure your entire team understands how your practice will uphold minor confidentiality. Uh, make sure that everyone in the practice is aware. Make sure that everyone receives that same training. You're all on the same page um, and you're all moving forward together. You know, you're all rowing in the same direction. Um, the more training you have, the more education you have, the more reminders you have um, will only make things move smoother um, for both, you know, HIPAA compliance, that right of access new requirement, um, as well as kind of confidentially, confidentiality in whole, especially with these new nuances with patient portal and telehealth as well. So as you can see, this is a highly regulated portion of the industry um, and it can be overwhelming. So if you are looking for next steps, um, 
you know, consider letting attentive help, especially if you're uncertain, you know, where your practice currently stands. We can assess where you're currently at with your policies and procedures, uh, help to provide recommendations, and of course, implement any of those new processes, procedures, functionality that we went over today. Uh, please visit our website, itenive.com. Continue to sign up for these webinars, um, but also, you know, consider we do have three-day fixed price on fixed price on-site consultations, um, as well as our healthcare industry advisor offering for areas of expertise on topics exactly like this one. Um, and then lastly, test drive our products. We actually, um, we had mentioned Chart Guard and Refund Manager, but we actually just launched a new virtual waiting room that integrates with NextGen and allows patients to wait in their cars too, and on the same, same track as telehealth a little bit. All right. Well, we have made it to questions. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chelsea for any questions those of you on the call may have. Um, I will preface, if you have a very specific question regarding a certain state requirement, um, we will likely not know the answer or the requirement without looking it up. Um, but other than that, you know, please ask away. We definitely have some time left over. That is our, our holiday gift to you all. <laughs> but I will go ahead and, and turn it over to Chelsea to to start listing out those questions. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. And again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you have questions, type them in the questions er area of the webinar control panel. And like I said at the beginning, we're just gonna go through these in the order that we received them. We only have a handful, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask, we're, we're here to help. Uh, first question, Cindy, I think this will be a question that I'll hand off to you. Uh, so to clarify, if a provider or CSS makes this marks this sensitive and suppresses the auto send would protect parents from seeing this? It would protect it in certain cases in terms of sending it out if you're sending a CCD or something of that nature to keep it from going. It's very important to not look at this as a, as a save all because it doesn't necessarily stop someone from inadvertently sending it out. It makes it a little harder, but it's, uh, it's definitely not foolproof. So the answer is a qualified yes. Great, thanks. And uh, Cindy, probably another one for you here. Uh, currently, we do not offer a patient portal to patients age 12 to 17. Is that the best practice, or what do you recommend? I, I, I don't know that I want to go with best practice, but I would have to say that is the most common practice. Most groups have decided not to offer portal because of the things that we've discussed here. It's very, very hard to control. Now, I think you'll be seeing in some of the newer, you know, new versions of MedFusion or PXP, as like where Infections has rebranded it. I think you'll be seeing that that'll, that'll be getting better because this is a problem everyone is trying to solve. I can also tell you I've not seen any system that actually handles it well. So a lot of groups to protect themselves have determined that they just won't have a portal for, the, for this age range. And that actually is not a necessarily a bad decision. That still, again, is a fix-all because if the patients were to call in or the parents were to call in or someone was to request a CCDA, that still doesn't have anything to do with the portal. So there's a lot of different, different variables to this. So it's really important to go back, understand the laws, understand the regulations, and make sure your team and your staff is educated on it. Great, thank you for that thorough, thorough answer, Cindy. Next question, is the 30 days from the date of the request or the receipt of the, re or the, receipt of the request? I can grab that one, um, and Carly, correct me, but it should be the date of the request. Um, so when, when you have that date going forward of, of when they requested that record, you have 30 days starting then. Okay, perfect. Uh, looks like we have two more questions. So again, we'll go through those. And if you have questions, feel free to send them in and we'll just keep going through them. Um, hi, if I do not have a state age out set up when I implement the new patient portal, could you clarify what age is used? Sure, so if you decide to not use your state's age out age, you can enter your practice's own age out age for the patient portal and that's just chosen at your discretion. Perfect, Carly, and it looks like this next question kind of follows up right with that. Um, in the age out settings, do the state laws override the practice preferences? We can look at that one. We might have to test it just because this is the new PXP um, portal setup. We'd have to look into it and see if we can do that in our demo environment. Um, Cindy, if you're aware of any functionality, I believe the state age out is what is used first and then it defaults. I think you're practice. right. And I, I have to be honest, PXP and this functionality is really, really like hot off the press is brand new. So we don't have a lot of experience with it yet. I think we would just have to test test it. 
Okay, well, we'll, we'll follow up uh, directly with an answer for the person who asked that one. Uh, our apologies for that. It looks like that's all the questions that we've received. So um, we'll stay on for just another few seconds here. Um, in the meantime, you know, again, as a reminder, feel free to reach out to us if you have any topics for webinars that you'd like to hear in the future. Uh, we always, we really like to do ones that, that you're passionate about hearing about. So, you know, let us know if there's an area that, that you'd like to learn more about, and we'd be happy to explore that possibility for, um, for doing a webinar on it. And um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving and I hope you have a nice holiday season coming coming up ahead here. And, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us if another question pops into your mind later. Um, and yes, we will be sending a copy of the recording along with the slides uh, within the next week here. So if you happen to watch it a second time because it's just so thrilling and you think of a question then, you know, you can always reply back to that email as well. <laughs> so thank you everybody and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay,